My name is Eduardo Camacho, and it's a real pleasure for me introducing this semi-plenary lecture, introducing Masoud Amin. Uh, <coughs> Masoud Amin holds the Honeywell and H.W. Sweatshirt in Technological Leadership. He's the director of the Technological Leadership Institute, and he's a professor at the uh, uh, University of Minnesota. Uh, before joining Minnesota in 2003, he directed all the infrastructure, security, research and development after 9-11 and served as an area uh, manager of security, grid operations and planning, energy market risk uh, policy assessment at the Electric Power Research Institute at EPRI in Palo Alto. Prior to that, he served as the head of the mathematical and information science at EPRI, pioneer research and development, and coined the term smart grid in 1998. Uh, he created and funded the EPRI, uh, in, uh, coordinated with the Department of Defense uh, Complex Interactive Networks uh, Systems uh, Institute, where that funded some more than 100 uh, professors and two, uh, 28 U.S. universities and over 240 graduate students. <coughs> He's uh, got a, a, an impressive number of board appointments, including the board of directors of the Texas r and &E, at, at the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, and the Board of Mathematical Sciences and Applications at the National Academy of Sciences. He is uh, uh, in seven editorial boards and is the founding chairman of the IEEE Smart Grid Newsletter and, and serves as a chair of the Control System Society Technical Committee on Smart Grids. He is a fellow of the ASME, a three-time uh, three professor of the year, at the University uh, of Washington <coughs> in St. Louis, and he was inducted into the University of Minnesota's Academy Distinguished Teachers in 2008. At EPRI, he received several awards, including the uh, 2002 President's Award for Infrastructure and Security Initiative, and twice he received the Chauncey Award, which is the Pre Institute highest uh, honor. Uh, well, uh, he's going to uh, talk about a very hot topic at the moment, and I'm, I'm sure you will all enjoy his talk. So do please uh, welcome Professor Ami. Good afternoon. Thank you, Professor Comacho, uh, colleagues. I'm really honored in the next uh, five hours to share with you Smart Grid and what are some opportunities for our society for control systems and dynamical systems. Uh, before I start, my presentation has three parts. One part is the overview macro environment in which smart grid and particularly contributions and engagement of our society, control system society, can be very pivotal, not only in terms of doing foundational work, but making a real impact in our societies throughout the world. That's the first part. The second part I will focus on high voltage transmission. And the third part on distribution systems consumer uh, part, if you will, and what opportunities there are in each one of them. So that's the quick overview of the entire presentation. So as you know, five weeks ago, population of our Earth crossed over seven billion people. It grew from six billion in 1999 to seven billion in less than 12 years. Currently, 
there are 1.2 billion people in the world have no access to electricity. Another 1.4 billion have inadequate access to electricity, meaning that they experience outages of four hours or longer per day. How many colleagues have been, have been or have lived or are working in parts of the world that rural electrification still remains a challenge? Raise your hand, please. Yeah. As a kid growing up in Iran in the 60s, my parents were medical doctors. They did volunteer work. As soon as you would leave big cities like Tabriz, where I lived, or Tehran, 20 miles, the quality of life would drop by two centuries. Uh, life as we know it was very different in those villages. That's when I decided, when I would see the pivotal role of electrification to improving quality of life, taking cracked soils that they had to deal with, and through, because of electrification, ability to put deeper wells, bring water up, transform agriculture. And in the process of that, increase life expectancy in the low 40s to low 60s. Huge jump in less than four or five years, you could make that difference. So as a kid, I decided I'm going to be an electrical engineer and focus on power. However, when I came to New York as a 16-year-old, my first week in America was New York City blackout, 77 blackout. I was even more convinced on the pivotal foundational role of electricity, not only in the developing parts of the world, but also in advanced economies of the world, because our GDP critically depends on reliable, disturbance-free, affordable, minimum footprint or no footprint electricity. With that in mind, currently there are 21 cities with 10 million or more people in them. By 2020, the number is going to go over 30 such mega cities. By 2050, 60 such mega cities, mostly in the less developed or developing parts of the world. Assuming 33% of the population of the world will have limited or no access to electricity, we still need to triple electrical generation to meet the demands of this pervasively growing population and more and more use of electricity. Also, this doesn't include the fact that if we move toward electrification of transportation to substitute cleaner sources and substitute electricity from cleaner sources as a substitute for polluting sources and fossil fuels. Most of this, currently we have about 4,000 gigawatts of generation capacity throughout the world. About a thousand of it in the United States. We need to at least triple that. Looking at the flow in the next 20 years, total energy flow, many colleagues have seen this before or have seen a variation of it from Lawrence Livermore National Lab for the United States. Basically, oil is the predominant one, about 40%. Natural gas is about 20%. Coal is another 20%. Nuclear is a smaller part. In the United States, is about 9% of total energy and about 20% of electricity flow. And then you see where they are going. In terms of total usage, transportation is the biggest use of electricity, industrial, commercial, and then electricity is only a subset of that. But then you look at the other end, on your right-hand side, where how much of it is useful energy, how much is wasted, either in energy conversion or at end use. Most of it is at the two ends. The middle part, transmission is very efficient. That's why Tesla's original dream of designing these large power plants far away from population centers and then bring them to cities' population centers is still valid. And it's about transmission and distribution together are about 90%, 92% efficient. Transmission alone is about 97% efficient. So looking at this system, we need to substitute for oil and other polluting sources. On the other hand, efficiency of the system is less than 44%, end-to-end -end efficiency even without, before we get to the last mile, before we get to the end-use customers. So when we look at the system, our community has an ability to think systems, look at the whole end-to-end -end from fuel source to end use, and go deep, go very deep and look at what are the biggest pinch points and what can we do 
to relieve those pinch points in a sustainable way, in an intelligent way. So we look at all sources of generation, sources of uh, plugged into the grid or they may be isolated, as well as end use. The last 130 years of electrification has benefited greatly from automation and controls. From whether it's a governor control, to control of networks, to a more, more advanced satellite-based sensing and signals that we use to, to detect disturbances, phasor measurement unit applications. We have had quite a bit of contributions together as a control society uh, in this area. The challenges, though, have increased, and there are many opportunities for our society from end-to-end -end power, as well as uh, unembedded controls, overlaid systems of sensors, communication and control devices to help better manage the system, to make it more secure, to make it more reliable, to make it more efficient, and to make it more resilient to, to unforeseen disturbances or changes, whether they're, they're man-made or natural. There are many opportunities, so I will share with you what they are. They range from dollars, watts, emissions, standards, and many more at every scale you can imagine. So how many colleagues remember my colleague Bruce Wallenberg's book on power systems? Many of you may have used that as a textbook, or if you took power courses, you remember this one. That the half of the system when it comes to generation, before we get to generation, the fuel source, furnace, pressure control, speed control, they're mostly mechanical. The, the other side, voltage control, electrical network, transmission distribution, load control, and the real and imaginary part, uh, real and reactive power, are parts that we as electrical engineers get into. So it's truly an electromechanical system. This electromechanical system is being transformed in mostly electronically controlled and IT-based network. And that's where the opportunities are for our community. From multi-scale perspective, it ranges from milliseconds all the way to decades or longer when it comes to planning and dynamics of the system. Lightning propagation, 10 to the minus 5 seconds, even uh, faster, similar almost to small electromagnetic pulse weapon, the way it introduces nearly an impulse function into the system. To state or transient subsystem synchronization and transient stability that is order of a fraction of a second up to a second, sometimes even up to several seconds, and then governor load frequency control, and then boiler dynamics and long-term dynamics. So from a bigger systems view, imagine please, on one hand, we want to keep the lights on. We have power, electric power system that's about reliability, public good, and the motto of the utilities to serve the load, the obligation to serve, to keep the lights on. On the other hand, economics, to get more out of the system, to get it more uh, basically uh, geared toward revenues, profits, and efficiency, and incentives. I submit to you, as a community, we are used to dealing with these multi-objective, complex problems. So one way would be not only looking at dollars or watts, but looking at the entire ecosystem, macro system in which we work. It's a highly complex, nonlinear, uh, uh, colleagues in the room who worked or work in uh, systems that have discrete event, dynamical systems, continuous phenomena with discrete jumps, this is a perfect example of it. But with a lot of stochastics and with some that we don't even know what the mathematical distributions for them are. So what we learned in control system, if you measure it, you know what to measure, you know the value of that, and then you can put that into a control loop. It's more than that. It's that is a requirement, that's a prerequisite. We also need to know how to price it and how to manage it better. So as we look forward from a big picture view to this decade and beyond, there are many layers in this multi-layered, highly interdependent, dynamical system. At the lowest level, at the end use, is the customer, consumer level, transmission grid, 
On top of that, the overlay of communication, information technology, sensors, controls, all the way from devices to the satellite systems, electricity markets, again, dynamics of ownership, investor grids, more than 90%, 85% of all the utilities in the U.S. are privately owned. Regulatory grid, an ability to base policy based on evidence, based on data, based on high fidelity on uh, simulation and understanding of the trade-offs to economy. The outages in the U.S. affect our economy. Power quality disturbances and outages affect our economy between $80 billion a year to over $188 billion a year. On an average year, it's about $150 billion in terms of losses uh, to our economy. So we need to be able to, to handle these multi-layered coupled, sometimes also uh, seemingly isolated disturbances can propagate bidirectionally throughout the system, whether it's a physical or whether it's a market signal or whether it's a regulatory policy. So we have had a slow decade in America, but how do you think the electricity usage, the loads have increased? We are streaming, we are storing, we are digitizing, we are Googling, we are um, tweeting like never before. What do you think impact of that has been on our electrical use? Summer peak demand has grown 16%. Average load per year has only grown because of slow economy 0.9% a year, but because 2000 to 2010, our 11 years total, has grown about 10%. Space cooling has increased partially because of increased temperatures uh, and need for basically and larger spaces that we use, larger footprint. But the biggest increase are digital devices, TVs, PCs, and other things. Just to share with you a nugget, I have a pop quiz for you. How many of you tweet? How many of your children tweet? So, how much do you think is the power in each tweet? 0 0.025 watt hours per tweet. What do you think is the total impact per week on need for electricity? There are 11 billion tweets per week this year. Actually, uh, sorry, 1 billion tweet in 2011. And this is not just a tweet. It's not just taking your device, plugging into the wall, and charging it. Remember, we talked about knowing the whole system, impact of the whole system. It's the server farms, all the communication and computation backbone that's required to do it. It needs, on a weekly basis, two and a half large nuclear power plants to meet the demand, 2,500 megawatt hours just to keep up with the tweets. How many, could, how many of you have cell phones, iPhones, Blackberries? How much electricity do you think that device takes? Again, not just plugging into the wall and charging the small lithium ion battery, the total system impact. Depends whether you have a 4G, how many apps you're running, how, many, how much you're video streaming, how much you're watching things on your device, takes between 240 watts to 300 watts per day, per device. So each device, imagine 300 watt light bulbs on 24-7 using electricity. The server farms are doubling every five years. And, and uh, if you have ever been to a server farm, they're like a football field, sometimes five megawatts, sometimes 40, 50 megawatts of load of electricity. There's another problem for our community, intelligent control, intelligent optimization of these server farms and electric use in that. IBM has shown that you can increase, uh, you can reduce consumption, but up to about 80% in many of the server farms, but by monitoring and optimizing use. However, at this pace, by 2030, about 20% 20 of total US electricity use out of the total one-fourth of the global use, one-fifth of it can be in server farms because of this new industrial revolution. 
So what infrastructure, quality of service, and security do we expect from this increasingly digital infrastructure that supports our quality of life and economy? I analyzed data, and it came out in, in, in IEEE Spectrum January issue on the number of really large outages. These are major outages that are 100 megawatts or higher, as well as impact on 50,000 or more customers. Uh, and those are mostly commercial, industrial customers, large ones. And I used data from Department of Energy's EIA. A subset of the data is available also from NERC. NERC data has more engineering analysis, root cause analysis, and so on, but it's a subset. So the number of the outages have been growing steadily since the mid-1990s. And if you normalize them, you put them all adjusted for 0.9% load increase and adjust them to 2,000 levels, numbers have increased doubled, nearly doubled, in terms of numbers affecting 50,000 or more consumers in the last decade. And also, outages that affect that have 100 megawatts or higher have gone from 152 to 248. The efficiency of the end-to-end -end system also, and this is valid applicable throughout the world, out of every 100 units of fossil fuels that goes into a generator because of the um, nature of the, uh, that energy con uh, conversion, we lose about 61, 62 percent of that. About 38.5% is fed into the national grid. Another 10% is lost, 9 to 10% is lost through transmission and distribution. So the end use gets only about 22 total, 22% end to end system efficiency. If you go from coal, which has about 35% to 40% efficiency to incandescent light bulb that has an efficiency of 5%, the number drops to 1.6% end-to-end system efficiency. So here is an opportunity for our community. How do we increase the efficiency of devices and the system? So I've had the privilege of since the 2003 blackout making several congressional briefings since then. And in 2009, on behalf of IEEE, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and NSF, I made two congressional briefings. And I made four recommendations to the Congress. The low-hanging fruit is the bottom one. It's so low, Secretary Chu says that uh, it has been such a low-hanging fruit, it has fallen to the ground. It's improving the energy efficiency. Second one is greening the power supply, expanding use of renewables, integrating them into the grid, expanding low, smaller, more modular, more advanced generation four nuclear power plants, and capturing carbon emissions, but that requires supportive public, public policy, because carbon capture needs about one-third more electricity in order to capture it. Then finally, breaking our addiction to oil by transforming transportation, substituting the sources that are polluting by non-polluting sources. And we, know, we all know as electrical engineers, what's the most efficient tra um, con um, uh, the most efficient carrier of energy? Is it hydrogen? Is it uh, uh, liquid fuels? Are they electrons, uh, compressed air? We know what it is. Are electrons the most efficient carrier of energy? So electricity is really the carrier of choice for energy. And that's why we need the top one to build a stronger and smarter electric energy infrastructure. And underneath that, transform this network into a smart grid, which I'm going to talk about next, expand the transmission by about 9% high voltage to integrate renewable sources, mostly uh, wind, solar, that are in remote areas into the larger backbone, and develop massive energy storage technologies in order to handle intermittent nature they have. So around the same time, in, July, in June of 2008, Nature magazine interviewed me about what is a smart grid. So I did a drawing on my little whiteboard in my office and took a Blackberry picture on my Blackberry and emailed it to them. The graphic artist did a much better job than I could have ever done. Basically, this is for a microgrid. This is not the high voltage transmission. This is just at a city level or community level, retrofitting buildings with solar panels or solar thermal panels, putting local 
combined heat and power, electronics communication on top of that to monitor power electronics, their efficient use and their reliability. And then put smart devices, smart chips, initially in our thermostats, in our meters, and over time work with vendors to move them to HVAC systems, to refrigerators, to dishwashers. And this overlay of intelligence with security built in in order to improve the efficiency, reliability, security of the system. The best wording I have ever seen anybody use to describe smart grid is actually the terminology that I'm sharing with you that is coming out of about four years ago from the Energy Independence Act. And let's read it together. It's the policy of the United States to support the modernization of the nation's electricity transmission and distribution system that can meet future demands for growth, demand growth, and to achieve each of the following, which together characterize a smart grid. Increase use of digital information and controls technology to improve reliability, security, and efficiency of the electrical grid. Dynamic optimization of grid operations and resources with full cybersecurity. That is what we can do as a community in control system society. And if you like my view graphs, please give me your business card afterwards. I'd be happy to email it to you. So no need to take extensive notes. I'd be delighted to, to send it to you. Since then, there have been many definitions of smart grid, whether it's FERC, DOE, GE, IEEE, Wikipedia, but it boils down to three things, technology, which are two-way communication, sensing, distributed computing and controls in a hierarchical setting, distributed at the lowest level, but the top level basically you have a hierarchical system, what our community is familiar with, reliability of the system and efficiency, including demand response and consumer savings and reduced emissions. So there are many definitions, but there is a unified vision. The vision is and a, a highly instrumented system. The red dots that you're seeing are sensors, whether they're in the coal-fired plants, in the transmission, in the smart meters, in our substations, homes, commercial buildings, or electric vehicles or plug-in electric vehicles. Interconnected by communication fabric that meets every node. Long distance is fiber optic and satellite microwave. As you get closer to the customer, I will share with you what we are doing, what is going on to do four things. Engage customers, give them choice on their mobile devices with a secure system built in, enhance efficiency of the system, increase reliability of the system, and enable integration of renewables and electric transport, transportation. This is not new. This is a timeline of just the last 20 years. It began with EPRI's common information model that enables you almost like a, uh, a connector for Lego pieces to plug and play various vendors, whether it's from Honeywell, Siemens, ABB, you could plug into that and operate the system for your energy management system. Then utility communication architecture for substation automation. And then EPRI DOD complex interactive network system, which I had the privilege of creating in partnership with Department of Energy, uh, sorry, Department of Defense, when I moved to EPRI in January of 98. Following that, IntelliGrid architecture, then DOE's GridWise in 2003, 2004, and Modern Grid Initiative, and then NIST and, and grid, smart grid demonstration projects. Since our community, was heavily involved in the initiative that Professor Comacho referred to, the EPRI Department of Defense Complex Interactive Network. Um, that really provides a solid foundation just in the last 12, 13 years that our community has been engaged in, and it's a good one to build from. It was during 98 to 2002, I had the privilege of briefing EPRI's Research Advisory Committee in January of 98 on something called Smart self-healing grid. We intentionally dropped at the time after that smart because we thought then people would think you guys are pointing a finger that our system is dumb. Why are you putting smart in it? So I kept referring to it for many years as just self-healing grid, even though we had originally called it smart self-healing grid. 
108 professors, over 240 graduate students from 28 U.S. universities were involved. 58% of money came from my budget as, as the head of mathematics and information science at EPRI, 42% from DDR&E, and actually from Deputy Under Secretary of Defense for Science and Engineering. And out of that, we extracted 19 technologies. Umbrella over seven of those is what we call smart self-healing grid. What smart grid really does for us, I share with you some nuggets peak demand reduction, because we want to, in a sense, move load. We are increasing asset utilization on average in the United States is about 54%. Only at peak time, we need a lot of capacity to meet that demand. And unfortunately, that capacity has been diminishing, both on generation side and on the transmission side, for the last 30 years. So the more effective intelligent management of peak demand becomes essential, and that's one of the areas that controls and estimation and also forecasting can play a pivotal role. Reliability we talked about and reduced emissions. So allow me to show you a brief part on what I mean. This is what we mean by smart grid. This is today's electrical system from generation, about 50% from coal, 20% uh, from natural gas, 20% from nuclear, 2.7, almost 3% from hydro dams. The remainder from renewables, geothermal, biomass, solar, and so on. The transmission with the old style meters that we have. And with really good, in many parts of the country, uh, phaser measurement units in the West Coast, AEP, TVA, and China, also on the eastern side of China, has a very robust system for phaser measurement system and wide area man, uh, measurement systems. What we are talking about, the, the electricity of the future will look like this. With fax devices that have power electronics, solid state breakers, smarter transformers, advanced power electronics, superconducting cables to increase the the basically ability to transfer and better control the system. When we look at the rest of the system, whether it is, let's say home, many of us uh, at home, your car can be both a, uh, a battery and it can be a distributed energy resource, depending on the life of the battery and intelligent management of how we charge, discharge the battery. With all the various devices, we put in intentionally medical equipment because of aging workforce and aging population we have. So when you look at, for example, commercial sector, similarly, various uh, locally uh, going for as much as almost the net zero buildings. Warehouses are easy to do net zero building because they don't use much electricity. But if you have a server farm, if you have a high-end manufacturing, that's a different story. It's not going to be, uh, it's, it's not trivial to make it completely self-sufficient. Industrial sector, I put a manufacturing use in there that uh, they account just industrial agricultural customers are over 47 billions a year in utility revenue, utility side of it. And there are, as you know, many robotics and other automated applications within that already. This is more automating electricity part of that. So, and also putting the dollars on what? So the home, when the price is, is low, charging the car, when the price is high, uh, being able to sell the electricity or use electricity um, that you have stored. So when we look at all this, when we look at all this, this transformation is possible. In the last 12 years, my colleagues and I, this is actually what I do at University of Minnesota, we look at these as complex dynamical systems. So here, maybe difficult to read in the back, but we put grid efficiency, we put um, grid security, each one of them, the links that you are saying are feedbacks. Feedbacks that are going on. You click on these, they give you the differential equations or sometimes just data sets that we use to simulate them. So we set it up as a complex dynamical system 
and we look at we look at really four things reliability security efficiency and resilience of these systems however the more instrumentation we put the more data we are going to get currently we are we are at about at average utility we have about uh, 120 terabytes of data coming to them a year the number if we put more instrumentation and smart grid is going to grow up to about 820 terabytes of data in that area. There are many players in this field, and I'm sharing with you all the way from transmission, generation, to end use, who are some of the players and opportunities that are pursuing in that. You recognize many of them. For our community, basically the, the, the opportunity is better situational assessment, better situational awareness, almost the origin of this work when I moved to EPRI was I had started from an aerospace background, putting basically more better avionics and controls in fighter planes for McDonnell Douglas, for NASA, for Department of Defense, and logistic, large-scale logistic networks for Department of Defense. So the same idea of putting that overlay in the aircraft, in the components, for better, uh, for better carrying out uh, basically of the mission and of the whole network. There's more dependence because of that on computation information technology, but also there is more complexity. System integration becomes more of a challenge and has to be as part of initial design. Uh, and yesterday we had a, a great plenary talk uh, by Alberto talking about some of that. So verification ver and validation becomes critical in making it happen. The other part is, do you centralize or decentralize the control? So I'm going to talk about that aspect for our communities coming up. And there are many challenges for us, our community in the smart grid. Uh, large-scale stochastic, many of it also uh, basically uncertain uh, integration of renewables, storage into that control of the system so that you're keeping the system at 60 hertz or other parts of the world 50 hertz, incorporation of distributed generation, plug-in electric vehicles as both sources and sinks, and demand response, including smart meters. Many people think smart meters means they have a smart grid, but we know better it's just a node in the end-to-end -end system. But there are many parts under that in terms of synchronized measurement technologies, system integrity protection schemes, new sensors, and also control of the whole system in a way that the system becomes more secure. So let's talk briefly about high voltage, and I will share you a, a bunch of uh, highlights within that. When you look at this, just the high voltage, and in America we have over 450,000 miles of 100 kV and higher. The ISO uh, independent system operators basically are the grid operators man manage it. There's real-time congestion management, there's system monitoring and control. Action, if you have, Fast uh, phaser measurement units is about measurement every 160 milliseconds. If not, it's done every three seconds. And that goes all the way from real time, all the way to markets, which is in blue, and then longer term, ability to do grid construction. However, this is a system that must have instantaneous balance. And I'm borrowing a slide from our colleague Joe Chow from RPI and, and our friend from New York ISO. This is the frequency of the system oscillating around 60 hertz during the last episode of Survivor. Why do you think it happens? Last episode of Johnny Carson show, Super Bowl have exactly the same type of behaviors. Why do you think it happens? Commercial breaks, use of facilities during commercial breaks. So to model it, I share with you some of the work we have done. We model, let's say, the Western United States, which is 11 Western states, two Canadian provinces, and a little bit of Mexico, just the, just the northern tip of Mexico. We need about to do the real regional assessment and regional whether they're long term or applied to real time. We need to model about 13,000 buses. Real time state estimation, topology estimation, what's energized, what not, what not energized, and security assessment. Need system restoration, fast restoration, and analysis tools. This is showing you the signal 
the actual phaser measurement signal that led to blackout of the West Coast because a tree um, attacked the line in the border of Portland and California, uh, in the border of Oregon and California on August 10, 1996. You see, there are precursor signals that when undetected, you have a few fractions of second in order to take corrective action to do it. And here is more. And that, this data, the data you're seeing was collected really for, for maintenance for later on. It was not connected. Well, the, the loop wasn't closed for real-time control. It's a high-dimensional problem, though it's non-trivial. If you want to, let's say, model one-fifth of the North American grid, if we think the next 20 years we really move toward the continental scale grid, to model one-fifth of it, we need to model 40,000 buses, 50,000 lines, 3,000 generators, which is about one-fifth of the total number of generators in North America, with 120 con control areas. Each line has a capacity limit. Putting those constraints on, we operate under N minus two contingency criteria for bulk transmission, high voltage, means any single element being out should not cr create a blackout or drop load. So we put some shock absorbers into the system. CDs, most of them work with N minus two contingency, means any two elements being out should not create any change in the quality reliability of the system. So we, even with N minus one criteria, we have we have to, in a sense, which is withstand loss of any line, any generator, 53,000 contingencies times 50,000 is 2.6 billion constraints. So it's an optimization with 2.65 billion constraints that has to be done quickly. So it's not possible to do it at that level. So what do we do? In, 2000, in 1998, we created an initiative I, I mentioned earlier, epri DoD complex interactive networks, to exactly go after these type of problems and the multi-layered problems. Energy, oil and gas, water, power grids on a large regional level and continental level, overlay of telecom, including underground or satellites, transportation distribution systems, and then energy markets. 108 professors, over 240 graduate students were funded through this in 28 US universities. And out of that, 420 publications, refereed publications, and 24 technologies came up. In a nutshell, our goals, and this is right out of my presentation, this part from 1998, to do really five things to detect precursors, what you saw, anticipation of disruptive events, look ahead simulation trajectories with ellipsoids of uncertainty around them, and to be able to do corrective action and move them to a more stable subspace. Fast isolation and adaptively reconfiguring and islanding the system and enabling rapid restoration. This in a nutshell is really making a resilient system, system that will be hit but can withstand and reconfigure and come back to full operation. So for the utility side of it, electrical part, failure analysis, fast failure analysis, vulnerability assessment, self-healing, our DOD portion of it, we did it on something called network-centric objective force, that the battlefield is a network. And actually, this is not part of future combat systems, that platoons are going to have the ability to get the battlefield information and direct the, their, their actions in a way which gets full situation awareness for what they need to do. Wired magazine had a quotation even as far back as then. They, uh, they, they said that every node in the network of the future is smart, responsive, adaptive, price smart and eco-sensitive, and adaptive and flexible. So to share with you a few highlights on what we have done since then, it's a really four subsystems that we had to model. One is the information and communication system. Another one is power system and energy electricity markets. The other part is protection and control systems and then human agents as well as threats and disturbances. What we found out is that human beings, as we know, are the most susceptible to failure, but in many of these are the most resilient and the most adaptive in management of recovery. So how do you model 
bonded rationality of humans and how do you enable or support decision support under emergency situations. So the six consortia that worked on this, you're seeing the names of the universities, each had a focus area. It went from mathematical foundations that John presented this morning. Um, we had the privilege of collaborating together from Caltech and colleagues at Stanford, MIT, all the way to practical, to defense against catastrophic failure, anticipatory dispatch of small generators. So we looked at, here's a challenge for our community, and it's on the on the lower right hand side. So let's say you take this sub part of the system, the regional part I talked about, those are your G minus, G sub zero, G one, G two, these layers. What do you think is the best way to control it, to monitor it, that would enable more reliable, efficient, resilient, secure control? Is it centralized? Is it distributed with coordination, communication among them, or is it perfectly decentralized? This is from our colleagues from Caltech and UC Santa Barbara's work. What do you think? Any suggestions? And I'm actually, I should tell you, I'm, for, I'm, I'm wording the question a little bit, in a little bit of a tricky way to get you thinking. It's actually all three. At the lowest level, is totally, perfectly decentralized, but quick action in the order of milliseconds. Mid-level, that's coordination, millis hundreds of milliseconds to seconds, is distributed. Top level, that's doing strategic load forecasting, other things is centralized. So it ends up being, being at the lower level, protection agent, fault, fault isolation, frequency stability. These are very fast, they have autonomy, and the order in the order of milliseconds, tens of milliseconds. Mid-level, they're, they're working in the event filtering and uh, command interpretation, model updating, is it valid, is it not valid, and then top level. My colleagues from neuroscience saw this presentation and they were telling me, Masood, this is exactly the way human nervous system, actually, mammal, and actually mammalian uh, nervous system works. So it was, it came out of uh, many simulations after 9-11, when I had the privilege of doing the security R&D, we simulated, actually we didn't, we have no close form mathematical solution for this, so we had over 970,000 simulations for the West Coast. How can we guarantee or minimize impact of attacks or disturbances on the, on the part that you're seeing here? And then for the East Coast, it was over 1.6 million simulations to evolve to to, if you will, to, to what would be the best architecture. So this was the work that is non-sensitive done by University of Washington. It's a model of the Western Great Southern California, Arizona, Pacific Northwest. Model was provided uh, by Bonneville Power Administration. What if lines from um, Arizona into California are taken out? The system forms two self-supporting islands. We, we also did many more, six, ten. We couldn't keep the lights on all the time, but in this case, if we don't have the new model, the new simulations and ability for self-healing, frequency just drops and you have voltage collapse and blackout. Using our new model and new technologies for, for self-healing grid, you see a few flickers of the light. It measures not just frequency, rate of change of frequency, and you get a better design. For larger scale, uh, we analyzed uh, 2003, August 2003 outage, again, same, same type of results. So a challenge for our community, one area is, can we detect precursors that are taking the system to really nasty subspaces and quickly create defense mechanisms against them and reconfiguring the system? That is a major sustaining challenge for our community. We're working on that and we have a tool that we use, you know, we don't need supercomputers to do it, we are just using gaming machines, Alienware, and we do health monitoring by displaying it to grid operators, what's available, what is in good shape, is in green, where we don't have data would be white, and where we can reaching warning signs would be uh, yellow and orange, and then red would be, and we can do root cause analysis. So overall, it's a whole system upgrade that we are going to need to develop, and it's going to need a lot more um, 
volume of data to be handled and latency has to be in the order of milliseconds. And this is a huge communication system challenge. So from a, the enabling technology, the biggest one in this area is sensing communication and data management instrumentation, monitoring analysis, automatic control within that, and then advanced materials including from high temperature superconductivity to power electronics, and then distributed energy sources. So to conclude this part of the talk, and then I will show you only three slides from consumer side, the three challenges, intelligent sensors and communication, and, uh, and communication system and analytics, increasing and making the power flow more flexible by use of fax devices, DC, power lines and power electronics, and secure systems from embedded control to uh, the overall system against cyber security and attacks. For lower voltage distribution system, the opportunities are, are plenty. And I'm gonna fast forward and show you what's being done Actually, I show you one example of integration of the wind into, did it, we did this for University of Minnesota Morris, which is one of the campuses in Minnesota, integrated wind with power electronic storage into the grid. Look at what happened in 2008 in terms of energy balance. Red is purchased fossil from, from local utility, it went down. Yellow is the CO2 footprint. By 2010, it went carbon negative. And now we're working on putting an overlay of communication devices over 22 buildings in the college campus. So having worked on large scale power grids for nations, having done also volunteer works in villages, rural parts of the world, I can tell you that there are many opportunities, but I think the biggest opportunity now is at the, is at the load level and it's at the building level and microgrid level. So, our colleagues at, at IBM have done a lot of great work in that area in mapping out, mapping out what these uh, commu communication systems are, what you need. The linchpin in this is also latency, bandwidth, and uh, security. And we have looked at communities. I'm grateful to Dr. Man Suli from Honeywell. He shared yesterday a presentation on home energy network. You're basically meter becoming your home energy manager and putting the, the analytics and the sensing within that. The other part is what we have done in Minnesota, integrating the system into an intelligent microgrid locally. Whatever renewable sources, local sources are available. And this is an example in St. Paul, Minnesota, putting solar thermal on top of a major building. And the benefits of these, I'm not gonna to take too much of the time on the benefits, has been immense. By putting the smart grid, you basically save, you reduce outages by 49 billion, reduce emissions by 18, 12 to 18 percent, and uh, also increase the efficiency by about 5 percent. There are many examples in the U.S. Uh, we, are, we have uh, put about seven billion dollars in smart grid, most of it on smart meters and end use. We still need to do a lot more on the whole system. China has put 7.3 billion and will put another 96 billion dollars in, in this decade in that. South Korea, Jeju Island is a very good example of it. And South Korea has put 65 million in Jeju Island, which is a smart grid, fully integrated city. Uh, island and by 2030 they want to transform Korea into that. Brazil also similarly for different reasons aging infrastructure. EU uh, smart meters are the part shown in red. EU has put about four billion euros into it. Uh, a lot of the uh, smart meters in uh, that you're seeing was for getting better measurement of what's going on and reducing in parts of Europe theft of electricity. West Virginia, coal producing country, I mean coal producing state. National Renewable Energy Lab, National Energy Technology Lab did an assessment of cost benefits of smart grid. The biggest opportunities are for them advanced metering infrastructure, demand response, distribution management system and distributed energy resources. So to conclude, for our community, there are many opportunities. I've highlighted them here in maroon. 
distribution automation, smart metering to improve load models and profiles and feed them into the control systems through that architecture that you saw hierarchical uh, system we talked about, device monitoring, self-healing, diagnostics, prognostics, communication infrastructure that gives you opportunity to improve diagnostics, fault protection for sensor networks and for the smart grid, and then alternative architectures for that. So there are many opportunities for us, whether it is on the security enhancement of the system, fast self-healing and modeling, many. We have a IEEE smart grid vision for control system project that Dr. Anu Anaswamy leads. We had our kickoff meeting and one of the groups came up with theoretical game changes for controls community. And these are the five of them. Propagation mechanism for cascading failures, reachability, robustness, analysis for hybrid system of the sort we talked about, analysis and design of massively distributed control system, fair market mechanisms to promote renewables and storage, and then techniques to analyze fragility and risk of highly optimized systems. There are three resources that I would highly recommend. One is the Smart Grid newsletter. I have the privilege of serve, you know, serving as its chairman. We welcome your contributions and also please to sign up free of charge. Just Google Smart Grid newsletter, IEEE, you'll find it. We have our own control system society's technical committee on smart grid will be meeting at three o'clock today uh, in salon nine here on the main level and then uh, dr uh, uh, professor anusbami's uh, leadership and the team 25 colleagues we are working on smart grid vision project for control system so please talk to me to dr tariq samad or dr anu anusbami this is not new what you saw Albert Einstein had many wonderful contributions. Just a small quotation from Albert Einstein. Computers are fast, accurate, stupid. Human beings are incredibly slow, inaccurate, and smart. And brilliant, sorry. Putting the two together. Have you ever done that before? Control community has done this for many areas. Whether it's manufacturing, whether it is avionics, whether it's systems, we have done many of these before. And there are now many opportunities in smarter transportation, smarter policing, smarter power, smarter governance enabled by that. So uh, these are all the areas that we can contribute to together uh, as a society, as a community to improve reliability. And ultimately, the end goal in conclusion is to turn an infrastructure that was built for lighting and refrigeration and, in, and improve that, transform it to a network to provide support for digital economy. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much. I, I don't think we have any time for questions, but I'm sure Professor Amin will uh, uh, answer any questions in, in the coffee break. Thanks very much again. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Oh, no. 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 Oh, no.